One hundred years ago, in 1866, the Reverend Alan Wright, a Choctaw Indian, gave this state its name, Oklahoma. Two Choctaw words meaning red people. Later, when Oklahoma became the 46th state to enter the Union, not only its name, but its official flag recognized the Indians' historic influence. The shield, the feathers, a peace pipe, and an olive branch. But in 1866, both peace pipe and olive branch were being ignored, for the West had not yet been won. The great Indian wars of the plains were just beginning and would in large measure be the destructive last stand of a subjugated people. In those years, however, five tribes of Indians always stood apart, not because of their valiant wars, but because of their peaceful ways and civilized conduct. They were the tribes who had come to Oklahoma against their will and who were to lay the foundations for this state's future. Now, these tribes, more than any others perhaps, can it be said, their history is ours, there's our heritage. Choctaws came first, settling in southeastern Oklahoma in the lands of the Kaimichi River. At the time, all this was part of the historic Louisiana Purchase. 500 million acres of western frontier negotiated from France in 1803 by President Thomas Jefferson. At a cost of only 15 million dollars, or about three cents an acre, Jefferson had not only doubled the size of the United States, but had put in motion its first major post-revolutionary expansion, the great westward push beyond the Mississippi. It was one of this country's major transactions, but it was also the prelude to one of its most regrettable. For within 14 years, into the southwesternmost part of the Louisiana Purchase, in what is now Oklahoma, there commenced at the direction of the federal government a forced migration of 25 years that has few, if any, parallels in United States history. Affected were five tribes of advanced Indians, including besides the Choctaws, the Cherokees, the Creeks, the Chickasaws, and the Seminoles. Because of white settlement and political pressures, which had been building since the American Revolution, they were ordered to leave their homes of centuries in the states of the Southeast, and on to new lands, largely undisturbed and only partially explored. These new lands stretched from the Red River in the South to the Illinois River in the North, from the Arkansas border in the East to the Great Plains in the West. For almost a hundred years, this vast area would enrich history and create legends as Indian territory and would be occupied by a distinguished people that the Congress would name in 1876 in an act of supreme tribute, the Five Civilized Tribes. 
Early in the 1830s, the administration of Andrew Jackson commanded five tribes of Indians in the southeastern United States, Georgia, Tennessee, Mississippi, North and South Carolina, Alabama, and Florida, to move further west away from white settlements. In a series of executive orders, acts of Congress and forced treaties, the Indians were guaranteed new lands in exchange for the old which were to be open to settlement with or without Indian permission. Their improved fertile lands were eagerly sought, and Jacksonian democracy, not indifferent to backwoods politics, made Indian removal an aggressive, basic policy. Only a very few were willing to go. The others petitioned the President and the Congress for relief. Some minor consideration was given mainly because these five particular tribes seemed to be so different from other Indians, so surprisingly well educated in the usages of organized society. In fact, their dress was a likeness of the white man's, contrasting sharply to the traditional Indians. For example, Sequoia, the legendary Cherokee, had only passing respect for color, as seen in his famous turban, but otherwise looked as if he could have served in Jackson's cabinet. His name was George Guess, but in Cherokee, Sequoia and his legacy is all around us. It was he that devised by himself a system for his people to read and write. But an even more revealing portrait of the age is that of John Ross, who led the Cherokees for more than 40 years. In every way, the man of style and charm in 1832. Ross and Sequoia demonstrate forcibly the widespread intermarriage between the five tribes and white missionaries and early European pioneers. It was this fact that accounted for their adoption of the white man's manner, from living in some instances on plantations to owning Negro slaves, from sending their children to school and church to having constitutional self-government. Yet in the end, neither Jackson nor the Congress would yield. No longer could the five tribes live on the lands they loved. The streams, the hills, the forests, where in the words of the Choctaw chief, Pushmataha, they had grown up as herbs of the woods, only to be broken off like a dead branch from an old tree. They marched into exile on what they called the Trail of Tears, several overland routes of 1,200 miles. Along these trails, prodded by federal militia, 60,000 Indians at various intervals often went without essential food and clothing in the midst of winter. More than 10,000 died, sometimes left unburied beneath a bush. Those that survived never forgot, nor have succeeding generations. To many Indians living today, one of the most vivid memories of their childhoods was the constant telling and retelling by their great-grandparents of the misery of the Trail of Tears. One such Indian is 80-year-old Mose James of Tuscahoma. The Indian people had long days of suffering. They had to walk with no shoes, sleep with no blankets. When they got sick, they were left behind. The women cried many tears when their young died but they had to keep going. The soldiers would say, you can't stop until we get there. When my people got to Oklahoma, the white man said, these are your lands as long as the water runs and the grass grows. Although the five tribes wound up in close approximation, their roots were as different as their languages. The Choctaws were first, then the Cherokees, the Creeks, the Chickasaws, and finally, the Seminoles. Still another Indian who remembers the stories, told more than half a century ago, is 76-year-old Albert Pike of Tallahena. It hurt the old people most. They didn't know where they were going or why they had left. 
When their clothes wore out, they walked in rags. The army had promised money to keep the Indians on their journey, but the army brought no money. The Indians didn't hate the army, but they were hurt because they were lost. Each tribe had its own tragedy. Whether cholera, floods, frostbite, or starvation, their only common bond was the government's advocacy of their displacement. Earlier, some whites had laughed with scorn as they watched the Indians leave their homes, touching streams, rocks, leaves, and trees in apparent farewell. But now other whites watch these same Indians suddenly become helpless refugees and mourn their plight. One newspaper wrote, the last remnants of these once powerful tribes are now crossing on their way to new homes in the West. To anyone who has been familiar with their impassive bronze faces, it brings associations of peculiar sadness to see them leaving the hills that gave them birth. They leave names for many of our rivers, our towns, our counties. And for so long as this state remains, these Indians who once owned all her soil will be remembered. When the five tribes finally got to Oklahoma, the center of the federal military and related activities was Fort Gibson, built in 1824 near Muskogee. Its story, in the words of one historian, is an epic of the prairies and a tale of the winning of the great Southwest. As the farthest west outpost at the time, it was also the most convenient vantage from which to watch the five tribes reconstruct their disrupted lives. As the years passed, under the suspicious eyes of U.S. cavalry, the tribes, now called Indian nations, cleared the land, building homes and schools and churches. Planting fields and orchards, despite grave shortages of money. They lived within these boundaries, confined on the east by Arkansas, on the north by Kansas, the south by Texas, and the west by other scattered nomadic tribes, the so-called wild Indians. These were years of Indian uncertainty and confusion. Still, they struggled on. By 1860, the five tribes had been in Oklahoma for about 30 years. Then suddenly, the Civil War. In the beginning, the tribes had argued among themselves on three possible choices. The Union, the South, neutrality. But arguments became quarrels, and quarrels became armed rebellion. Some Indians joined the Confederacy, others the Union armies, still others joined neither. Ignoring for the most part the counsel of their leaders, who were almost as confused about allegiance as were the individual tribe members. The best men of each tribe went off to war, but in all directions. In the end, they were all considered rebels, even though the Creeks and Cherokees sent more men to the north than south. But the leaders had signed treaties with the Confederacy, some reluctantly, some gladly. There is a common historical point of view that geography, not sympathy, drew the tribes to the southern cause, in spite of the fact that some wealthy Indians managed huge plantations with Negro slaves. But they were not representative. What was more pertinent, more persuasive in the final decision, was the geographic reality that Indian territory was adjacent on the east and south to Confederate states. Their own safety, therefore, in jeopardy, they committed themselves legally to the South. They would long regret it. <laughs> 
In the meantime, Confederate forces had enlisted the one Indian general of the war, the Cherokee Stan Wadey. It is a famous name in Cherokee history, replete with glory, but best remembered perhaps as that of the last Confederate general to surrender, more than two months after Lee's capitulation at Appomattox. The grand climactic battles of the war had been fought elsewhere, yet few areas were scorched more than Indian territory. In 1865, it was one vast cemetery of destruction. The ruin was almost absolute, even though the great armies never marched here. As the victor of war, the United States could dictate the terms of peace. To the five civilized tribes, once again straggling refugees, its policy of reconstruction meant that their tribal lands would be cut in half. Partly because of vengeance and its role of conqueror, the federal government acted arbitrarily, without considering that in stripping the tribes of half their lands, it was neglecting the solemnly signed treaties of 35 years earlier, which consigned these same lands to the tribes forever. The government insisted that tribal involvements in the Civil War as Confederates nullified the treaties and that in consequence the tribes had forfeited their claims. In time, though, they accepted the federal decree without resorting to arms and began to rebuild the second such instance in as many generations. Many of their accomplishments still stand, as do other examples of their enterprise in those 30 years before the war. These are the monuments to a hardy people come together in a frontier territory only because of a geographical circumstance. Now, in the days after the Civil War, and for almost 20 years to follow, there would be attempts to consolidate them even further, to force the five nations ever closer together in eastern Oklahoma. The reason was twofold, to prepare the way for western Oklahoma settlement by whites, and to make room for other tribes recently chased from other states. There was very little law and order in Indian territory. Each tribe had a written constitution with a Bill of Rights attached, but these were mainly for self-protection, not for the control or concern of renegade whites who were illegally pushing into the territory by the hundreds. For a quarter century, they and such Indian groups as the Cherokee Star Gang would make prairie crime and Indian territory synonymous. These were the years of legend, of the outlaw as Robin Hood, and his one great implacable enemy, Isaac Parker, the hanging judge. From his federal district court at Fort Smith, Arkansas, Parker exercised almost sovereign power as an evangelist of justice. He sent more than 70 men to the gallows, always pronouncing sentence in an inflexible growl that ended with the words, until you're dead, dead, dead. Often, wanted men sought to escape his rope by fleeing into the hills of Indian country. Parker always sent his marshals in. Some got their man, others never returned. The post-war treaties had contained provisions that the five tribes would not oppose railroads. And in 1870, the first built by Katy, the Missouri, Kansas, and Texas Railroad Company, entered the Cherokee Nation in the north and veered southwest, passing through the Creek Nation and on across the Choctaw to the Red River and Texas. As they looked upon this railroad and the others that would soon follow, the tribes were also seeing the reason for the inevitable drift of further whites, who always seemed to think that their destinies belonged to the nearest mile of track. Further west, in the plains, fences were going up and the great cattle drives were ending. At the time, there was a saying that barbed wire ruined Texas, and to cattlemen, the same could be said of western Oklahoma.
Having started right after the Civil War, the mighty herds were pushed for 20 years. Epic drives from Texas to Kansas, through Oklahoma, over the fabled Chisholm Trail, with bands of hostile Indians threatening every mile. But by 1885, when the cavalry had largely subdued the Indians and made the prairie safe, fences had closed the limitless open range. It was from this age, brief but lusty, that would come the enduring glories of cowboys and Indians. These were the warriors of the Buffalo Plains. Their very names echoed the cry of war. It was mainly toward these tribes that had rejected the white man's way that was directed the saying, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. Whether for broken treaties, vanishing buffalo, trigger-happy cavalry, or their own militant braves, the western tribes were often on the warpath, ready to kill the nearest white. To the non-Indian, this meant a basic instinct for savagery. But to the Indian himself, it meant something different. For example, one Comanche chief, Ten Bears, at a peace conference with Washington officials about 1870, put it this way. There has been trouble between us, and our young men have done the war dance. But it was not begun by us. It was you who sent out the first soldiers, and we who sent the second. The blue-dressed soldiers came from the night, when it was dark and still, and for their campfires, they lit our teepees. Their scalps now hang in our lodges. A long time ago, this land belonged to our fathers. But when I go up the river, I see a camp of soldiers, and they're cutting down my wood or killing my buffalo. I don't like it. In time, though, he and all the other Indians of the plains had to accept it, and the life on reservations that followed. And so doing, they reluctantly passed into history, painted with war and faded greatness. The cowboy, on the other hand, emerged from the epic of the plains as the last romantic. A rough, tough adventurer, the cowboy has come out of the west of the 19th century into total glory, a good-humored giant of a man, shy and courageous, fearing nothing but self-expression. Despite exaggeration about his true character, the cowboy's part in settling the West was enormous. For in that period, between the Civil War and the 20th century, his presence and influence were instrumental in transforming Oklahoma from a land of hunting, grazing, and farming to one of cattle, coal, and railroads. This change was the forerunner both to Oklahoma statehood and the dissolution of the five civilized tribes. In 1872, Newspapers reported that between Indian Territory and the reservations of the Plains, there lay almost two million acres of unassigned lands available for homesteads. Seventeen years would pass before the first Oklahoma land run. But by nightfall on April 22, 1889, after the dust had cleared, homesteaders had established settlements with the names of Oklahoma City, Norman, Stillwater, El Reno, Guthrie, and Kingfisher. Together they formed what was called Oklahoma Territory, a portent of future development and the climax to one of history's great adventures. There would be other runs and other lands before the most spectacular one of all in the autumn of 1893.
History says it was the Cherokee outlet, not the Cherokee Strip. To secure individual tracts from the six million acres available, all of which was once Indian land, a hundred thousand settlers gathered at the southern line of Kansas and the northern boundary of Indian territory. At noon, September 16, 1893, guns were fired all along the starting line, all 180 miles, resulting in the most famous photograph of Oklahoma's history and causing the biggest, wildest stampede of modern times. The 20th century brought statehood to Oklahoma and also an end to the institutions and formal organization of the five tribes. They had fought it bitterly, reminding Washington that treaties had been signed as far back as 1830, specifically stating that the Indian lands would never become a state, nor any part thereof. Some measure of autonomy, the right of self-rule, had been theirs for more than a hundred years but never sovereignty. Never had theirs been the final word. Statehood meant they now had neither. Yet even today, within the tribes, there still exists some organizational rule. It is called the Intertribal Council, run by five members of each tribe and is intended to advance those special concerns of Indians. Its highest officers are the five leaders or principal chiefs of each tribe. Harry J.W. Belvin of Durant, Choctaw. Overton James of Oklahoma City, Chickasaw. W.W. Keeler of Bartlesville, Cherokee. John Brown of Sasakwa, Seminole. And W.E. McIntosh of Tulsa, Creek. Their leaders are either elected by the tribes themselves or appointed by the Secretary of the Interior. It is his department, through the Bureau of Indian Affairs, that supervises the federal services to all United States Indians. The Intertribal Council, in turn, is assisted by the Muscogee Area Office of Indian Affairs, which is the liaison between the Interior Department and the five civilized tribes. Specifically, the Council oversees the federal relationship of more than 40,000 Indians of tribal blood and seeks to secure their rights under existing treaties adjust their common cause, preserve their culture, and promote their general welfare. These objectives, once considered hopeless, are no longer unreachable. For since 1961, the Bureau of Indian Affairs has been guided by a policy established largely by Indians themselves. More than anything else, this policy, conceived by a special task force, which was appointed by the Secretary of Interior, Stuart Udall, has made the government and the Indian more friendly and compatible than at any other time since 1824 when the Bureau was created. The task force set down three main goals for the federal government in dealing with the Indian people. They are as follows. The, the goal of maximum economic independence for Indian men and women and their families. The goal of full participation of Indians of all ages in the great panorama of American life. The goal of equal citizenship privileges and responsibilities for all Indians. Here in Oklahoma, and especially here in eastern Oklahoma, wherein the five civilized tribes have been a great influence upon the course of our history, there is perhaps more self-sufficiency among Indians than anywhere else in the Indian country. There is also undoubtedly greater Indian participation in the affairs of the total community. But this is not to say that the Cherokees, Choctaws, Chickasaws, Creeks and Seminoles, the people who have shared a long destiny with the white man, are truly free from the pressures that have blocked their exist exercising all the rights and responsibilities of citizenship. <laughs> 
They are citizens, of course, and have been since statehood in 1907. But there is still sometimes a second class about that citizenship. While some of the five tribe members are among the most prominent citizens of eastern and southeastern Oklahoma, they are doctors, lawyers, educators, bankers, and businessmen. Others are unknown and unheralded, living on the edge of chronic poverty. It is with awareness of the subtle pressures upon our five tribes that the people of Indian Affairs in our area office in Muskogee have endeavored to carry out the mandate of the task force. There are therefore two kinds of Indians in the five tribes today. Those that compete openly in society, often spectacularly, and those that for various reasons exist in the shadows outside society. Uh, they, many of them don't understand yet the ways of the white man and they're fearful uh, they're afraid to try the unknown uh, they are they have what we call an inferiority complex because they fear to go into competition with the white man in his world because they feel that he knows so much more about his business than they do that they uh, will be more or less discriminated against they're just simply a fearful people who lack understanding. Uh, as the modern saying is, they lack the communication. This lack of communication, feeling of inferiority, and indifference to society on the part of many members of the five tribes are frequently said to result from past policies of the federal government. It's paternalism toward the Indian and it's neglect of treaties. The reluctance of the Indian to enter into society today, the first reason is that he's been under the supervision of the Bureau of Indian Affairs and not permitted to operate, shall we say, his own affairs on his own as he would like to do. Uh, the second phase would be they have violated treaties, they have broken promises. In the beginning, when the treaties were signed and the migration came to the Indian Territory, we, the five civilized tribes, were promised this land to be ours in kind forever, and that never at any time under any condition would it ever become a state, and that the United States government would protect the nations from any outside interference and that we would be permitted to have our own governments until time shall be no more. Certain uh, emoluments have been granted to the Indian during the Depression and they were presented or rather they were given or rather they were bought for them certain livestock for them to start a life anew and years afterwards they received statements for the cost that the government had been out in that livestock now that's just one example uh, the way that the promises have been not fulfilled and the pledges not kept is the reason why the Indian is skeptical, skeptical of uh, the United States government and taking their proper place in society. The consequences of this alienation are visible in these shacks, spread all over northeast Oklahoma. Inside many of them, Indian families sleep on floors, in circles around a pot-bellied stove, using water that has been carried from the nearest stream unaware of modern health standards. These are the extreme cases. Those Indians who often can neither read nor write, who barely understand English, who exist only because of federal or state welfare, who are totally exempt from the social progress of half a century. Since 1907, this condition of poverty has seemed to succeed itself, a pattern that has been almost impossible to break, because those Indians that are worse off 
living on exhausted land, refuse to leave it, either adhering to the ancient belief that land is sacred or fearing the outside world. Yet the Muskogee office, which spent five and a half million dollars to help the tribes in 1965, is trying gradually to solve the problem. The area director, Virgil Harrington, explains how. New legislation enacted last year by the state of Oklahoma, the Housing Authority Act, is perhaps one of the biggest and the most immediate breakthrough on the horizon for the Indians. For the first time, low-cost public housing aid is possible for people in Oklahoma who need it. This will enable the Indian people of Oklahoma to share in the public housing programs that are already underway in many other reservation areas. Any mention of housing raises the question of sanitation. We can point with satisfaction to the accomplishment of the United States Public Health Service in providing sewer and water sanitation facilities for many Indian homes. They also operate a network of hospitals and field clinics throughout the state with dramatic effect. Infant mortality rates, for example, have dropped 9% in the last four years. And death toll for TB dropped 18% in the past two years. All of this adds up to the promise of better life for the Indian people. In the end, that better life is contingent on education, which both federal and tribal officials consider not only essential, but the sure answer to the Indian problem. More than 90% of the children in the five tribes attend public schools. The other 1,064 in grades 1 through 12 are in boarding schools, maintained and supervised by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. They are there because their needs are special, whether for social, economic, or educational reasons. For example, the 376 students at Sequoia High and Tahlequah would probably be less concerned with education were it not for a school in which all students look upon one another as equal. There is here another instance of the Indian's past, of that fundamental urge toward association with one's own kind, that impulse to prove that people born into an isolated group are liable to be conditioned much more strictly than the members of a society composed of diverse elements. It is the objective of their education to bring down the real or imagined differences between Indians and whites, and to stress that the values in the Indians' past can serve him and his country in the present. But will the Indian accept these lessons of education? The answer in part comes from W. W. Keeler of the Cherokees. Indians before, all kinds of problems existed between the government and the Indians, where now the Indians are responding it's true that uh, they have a long way to go, but uh, also I think that this is going to mean something that long range will mean uh, a tremendous amount to uh, the United States because I feel uh, basically that the Indian has much to contribute to our culture and to our country. I think some of the uh, uh, former uh, uh, cultural values that the Indian had were extremely important the respect for the individual, the uh, ability to uh, uh, probably uh, meet all sorts of adverse uh, conditions and yet uh, not look back, the uh, inherent cultural, I mean inherent spiritual uh, feeling that almost all Indians have. I think can make a, a great difference. I think the very fact that we as a people have probably suffered and are now willing to uh, do our part, uh, forgive if there's any been real wrongs done, I think that uh, we can add because we can understand uh, suffering. I think we can contribute uh, from the standpoint of uh, these little things that the Indian Never, he was the first conservationist. He never really wanted to take any more than he needed to sustain his life. <laughs>
I think some of those things can be very important to our world as we get more population. At Wyandotte, at the Seneca Indian School, 215 students in grades one through eight are being introduced early to those strengths, to the joys of learning, of participating, of getting involved outside themselves. There is therefore reason to think that these children, in spite of large obstacles like language, will grow up to competition, will make it on their own. For it's been true since statehood and even before that those Indians who were acquainted early with education not only integrated easily into society, but often became society's leaders. It is then not so much the young Indian that concerns the tribes and government as the adult, the middle-aged, the elderly, who have lived their lives away from schools. For many Indians, it is too late. But for those between 18 and 35, there is institutional vocational training. Oklahoma State Tech at Oak Mulgee is one of the finest such schools in the nation, teaching more than 25 courses. The importance of this training can be measured by the fact that most Indians who are destitute know only elementary labor. They can do nothing else. Once training is finished, the Bureau of Indian Affairs offers help to graduates in finding jobs. 92% of those graduated since 1958 are gainfully employed today. The former Secretary of War, Major General Patrick Hurley, who grew up in Oklahoma among the Choctaws, said of Bacon College, I owe everything to the little school that saw potential in a poverty-stricken young man. At the time, he was speaking of the only college for Indians in the nation. But today it is attended not only by Indians, many on grants from the Bureau of Indian Affairs, but by all kinds of students. Yet its character is Indian flavored. From its buildings, mostly built with Indian money, to its dynamic art department, supervised by the nationally recognized Cheyenne artist, Richard West. West's approach to art and teaching is often said to conserve the values of the Indian heritage and to expand it in terms of the wider culture. Although the Bacon curriculum stresses subjects that will particularly affect the Indian's later life, it is arts and crafts that gives him understanding of self. For this reason and others, the Creek Nation in 1881 gave 180 acres of land on the rich farming slopes outside Muskogee for the college to pursue the ideal of its founder, A.C. Bacon. A Christian school planted in the midst of a people becomes one of the most powerful agencies in the work of civilization. Today in Oklahoma, aside from the five tribes, there are more than 63 other separate tribes living not on reservations, but in some cases in so-called Indian communities. There are examples of these throughout eastern Oklahoma, particularly in Adair, Cherokee, Wagoner, and Sequoia counties, where full-blood members of the five tribes comprise almost all the population. Usually they live on land that has been in their families since 1907. In that year, all Indian tribal lands, nearly 30 million acres, passed from tribal into individual ownership. Only one million acres remain, some held in trust by the government, some still owned by individuals. Why so much land was so quickly lost has several theoretical answers, ranging from federal mismanagement to Indian incompetence. The government's current policy on land is to assist in its development and conservation, to help the Indian properly manage his resources so as to improve his economic condition, his home and family life. In 1965, for example, the federal services in agriculture and modern technique enabled the tribes to produce 15 million dollars of goods and at the same time to double almost the value of lands. Only a very few Indians have benefited from oil, gas or uranium. 
The rest have had to acquire their income from the traditional source, the land, their principal, and oftentimes only possession. The Bureau's effort in this regard, as well as in other areas, has made it broadly respected throughout the five tribes. An indication of how much comes from Overton James of the Chickasaws and McIntosh of the Creeks. There was a time when the uh, Bureau uh, sat in the office, in the area offices, and they expected uh, the Indians who had any problems to come and bring their problems to the Bureau officials. But this has changed now, and especially during the uh, reign of Mr. Virgil Harrington of the Muscogee Area Office, because he and his staff are always helpful and eager and cooperate with all the tribes and come right down to the grassroots level and find out what's going on. We are gratified with the progress that's being made today in comparison to the non-progress being made some 10, 15, 20 years ago. The progress today is tremendous and it's made possible through the Bureau of Indian Affairs change of disposition towards the members of all the Indian races and the various Indian leaders uh, and the various tribes are in a position to uh, discuss with the Bureau of Indian Affairs their wants and their desires together with the Department of Public Health Indian Division and they are not only most cooperative, but they come to us and ask us what our needs are. And they go all out to help us. An example of this recently was a field trip by Harrington and Congressman Ed Edmondson of Oklahoma to an Indian public works project above Ten Killer Lake. The purpose of this project, financed jointly by federal and local funds, is not only to give vital temporary employment to Indians, but to provide the general motoring public with greater convenience, and most important, to make land transportation accessible to a large complex of Indian homes beyond the road's end. Through such programs as public works, credit and financing, assistance and industrial development, the five tribes are receiving all the social aids long available to others. Yet the average income of Indians in eastern Oklahoma is about 20% lower than that of non-Indians and is expected not to change for at least another generation. Among the five tribes today, there are in some members, but not all, those competing forces that have been pressed upon them for more than a hundred years. The need to conform to society and the instinctive urge to resist. To the non-Indian, it's sometimes difficult to understand why an Indian cannot easily accept a society with so much to offer. But to the Indian himself, there are many factors, mostly psychological, not liable to simple resolve. Yet through the slow process of education, self-development and exposure to responsibility, there may be an answer but it will not come soon. Until then, the Indian seeks to continue his present relationship with the federal government, believing that its obligation is justified by its past unfair and ungenerous treatment. But the Indian must also seek to integrate himself further, the reason for which was stated more than 65 years ago by a distinguished Full Blood Creek, Wiley McIntosh. No one with judgment can predict anything but disaster for the attempt to preserve Indian autonomy. The time for its disappearance has come, and it's better for the Indian that it should disappear. The fact may be a sad one, but it is nevertheless a fact that there is no longer a place on the soil of the Union for an Indian as an Indian. The pathos of this situation should and does appeal to all great men. But the logic of fate is not moved by the prayers of a fallen race, nor is their destiny averted by a tear for their end.
Not all but many Indians have accepted that plea, bringing to society at the same time a set of values that it needs. We find that uh, he may not be basically any superior being, uh, or especially noble, but still he is uh, an extremely intelligent individual, and given the tools of the average citizen, uh, I think that he will be able to, to make his mark. I think at the same time that we putting on uh, I'm, I'm a mixed-blood Indian, putting on the white man's hat and seeing the great uh, sacrifice that people make in their lives, their health, and sometimes their families, in the search of the dollar, in the interests of uh, making business deals, the tremendous rat race that we find ourselves in, in business, that we could very well take a leaf out of the Indian's book. Many of the values that are inherent with the Indian, I'm sure, would enable the average white man to find greater peace and probably truer success in his life. Those beliefs shared by all the leaders of the five tribes exemplify W.W. W. Keeler, who is not only principal chief of the Cherokees, but the chairman of the executive committee of the Phillips Petroleum Company. There was another Cherokee from Oklahoma who treasured his Indian blood as much as Keeler, and who, in his special way, was just as successful. These men represent not only the true heights that Indians can attain, but reflect an Indian character that others can imitate. To Indians like Keeler and Will Rogers goes not our understanding, but our envy. But for all the others in the five tribes, still in struggle, who suspect that the white man thinks himself just a little better, who think that he will never really understand, it is good to remember the old Indian saying, Great Spirit, help me never to judge another until I have walked two weeks in his moccasins. It is a saying that we could usefully apply to ourselves. Good night.